As all of you know, the Chinese invented movable type. Gutenberg didn't invent it at all. You know, that's what happens when you write the history books. The Chinese had invented movable when, type. When the West writes yeah, the history when books. The, West writes history yeah. books. the Chinese invent movable type about 300 years before Gutenberg. They have the technology for 300 years, including metal type. Right? And it goes nowhere. And we can talk about that. But Gutenberg reinvents it, doesn't know anything about what the Chinese are doing. And he produces the first book, the Gutenberg Bible in the West, in 1450. And here, if we can activate the camera, we can see this is an original page from a Gutenberg Bible. So this is 1450, John. It's the beginning of movable type. Now, here's why this is an amazing story. How did Gutenberg innovate to create this? What did he do? Well, guess what? There were no printer experts to call. He didn't call any technologists. There was nobody to call. But he borrowed from a dozen different fields. He was a goldsmith himself. So he figured out how to cast type because he was good with using gold. He actually invented the technology of lead casting, lead alloy casting, because he went and talked with people who were casting jewelry and said, how could I cast a lot of it? He invents ink in, by borrowing from the idea that ink shouldn't be water-based, water but oil-based. So that oil industry, it shows up in 1450 when this man realizes he needs oil-based inks. And by the way, where did he get the idea of the press? Well, from an ancient wine press, of course. He didn't invent the idea of a press. That had been around for hundreds of years. In fact, where did he get the idea of printing at all? Probably from cloth printers. He had seen cloth printers print on cloth patterns and said, well, why can't I print patterns of words? Now, it turns out he got really lucky. Because in China, there's 5,000 ideographic characters. So it's really hard to have a typecase. Latin only needs about 81 characters. That's it. Upper and lower case, some punctuations and a few things. And you can make every word, sort of like the four bases in genetics, right? Mm. So the Latin alphabet turns out to be a giant advantage for printing. He invents a synthesis of technologies, puts them all together, and in true tradition, goes bankrupt and is buried in a pauper's grave. They seize his assets, okay? He never well, makes a dime he from he printing. you should have known the publishing industry never makes a dime from well, printing. They know. seize his assets, they bankrupt him. We have no idea where he's buried. His creditors seize it and they make all of their money. Guess what, John? They don't print books. You know why? Everybody's illiterate except the church. There's no need for books. In fact, nobody wants a book. You know what they print? They print indulgences, forgivenesses, from God for a, remitting, a remission of time in purgatory. Indulgences are like money. In fact, Martin Luther rails against them later. He prints the best thing to money. He prints forgivenesses for the church, which they used to have to write out by hand. He prints them by the millions. Every city in Europe suddenly starts buying printing presses to print forgivenesses from God. A very high margin business, early business. Okay. <laughs> Early okay. subsidies. And Early tax, subsidies. Tax okay, we've seen this movie so, before. Okay. So, so do, do we know why Gutenberg decided to become a publisher? What prompted him to say, hey, it's time that we be able to propagate? He had failed at pretty much every business, and he thought he could make facsimiles of beautiful books and sell them to the church. Huh. The church basically said, we don't want any of your facsimiles. We don't want your synthetic book. We want beautifully written books. And so if you look at this page from, from the Gutenberg Bible, you can see they actually illustrate this P by hand. They don't literally use just printing. They print and then they illustrate to try to say, oh no, this is a hand-drawn thing, not just a machine-made book. So right. this is a whole story about synthesis of imagination. You can see this in the, in the room. Uh, yeah, you'll uh, be able to come, the see the, come see what the What do you have? Uh, All right, so now I'm going to tell a story about real imagination. So here we have a cuneiform comb. Why don't I zoom in here? This is 2000 BC here, and this is the origin of accounting, actually also writing. You see, it turns out in 2000 BC, for the first time, we have excess crops, which means you need granaries to store the crops. Well, guess what? If I'm going to bring my granary to a storage, uh, my crop to a storage facility, what do I want in return? I want a receipt, a receipt right? <laughs> Writing is invented for receipts, okay? <laughs> it's a cash register receipt. And guess what? They need a technology to prevent you from altering the receipt. So what do they do? 
they, bought, they go to the clay guys and say, can we fire these things in a kiln so nobody can modify the receipt to say, I've deposited 20, you know, 20 wheelbarrows and now I want 300 wheelbarrows back, huh. right? So they created a permanent writing technology using a stick to impress in it because they didn't want to draw characters like the Egyptians, so they narrowed it down like good abstract expressionists and they used a stick. Huh. Now, why does that matter? Well, it turns out it matters because of this. It's the beginning of big data. It's the beginning of data, period. It's actually the beginning of computers, is what it is. This, these are Jacquard loom cards. In the early 1800s, in the southern part of France, a man named Jacquard realizes that we could create a new kind of technolog technology in looms. Instead of having six-year-old boys crawl through the loom and reset the hooks on every line of a weaving, why don't we instead make holes in a piece of cardboard, string them up with strings, and run them through the machine so the hooks drop in through the holes in what looks like that. So this is a Jacquard loom today. There's not very many left. There you go. You can see the loom cards are running through the loom one at a time, resetting the hooks. Now Jacquard realizes that by making holes in pieces of paper, he can, which he got from the stenciling world, he said, well, stencils are used to make holes in paper and you can do artwork. He borrows from cloth printing, just like Gutenberg borrowed from cloth printing, Jacquard borrowed from cloth printing. He said, I can use the stenciling technology to drive hooks. And there's only one problem. The Jacquard room is a technological tour de force, but it's expensive compared to boys, the technology of boys is very cheap in 1800. It's expensive, and it does something that nobody wants. It can print anything, anything, no matter how complex. He's invented the general purpose loom, but nobody has ever wanted a general purpose loom. And for 70 years, the Jacquard Loom Company finds no market for its general purpose loom. Just in the south of France, they weave covers for chairs for royalty, those, those needlepoint fine covers, the Jacquard covering, so they make it for royalty. Imagination the, being ahead of its time? They had no imagination on how to persuade the world to use their new technology. So an innovation, but not imaginative. Exactly, enough. they had no imagination until 70 years later. Here's what happens. The grandson, of Jacquard is running the family business and says, I am tired of nobody buying our looms. This is crazy. And he has an idea. I'm going to create demand for these looms. It's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The textile industry has grown up in, in the UK and in somewhat in France now, and they're going to say, we're going to call on the textile mill owners now with these steam mills, and we're going to persuade them to put in Jacquard looms. And he calls on every one of these guys, and every one of them says, I don't need your loom. These boys are cheap. I don't care. Mm. And he comes up with this idea. He writes a program of 50,000 of these cards, 50,000. And here's what he does. He weaves a book in silk. This entire book has no printing. Let's see if I can align it properly here. Every page in this book is woven in silk. There is no printing here. Let me zoom, let me turn the... Uh... He demonstrates that for the first time, this technology is so good at weaving you can weave things, all the words, all the pictures, everything in this book is woven in silk. And he takes it around to the mill owners, and he doesn't give the book to the mill owners. He gives it, ready for this? Here's imagination. He gives it to the wives of the mill owners. And here's what he says. He says, ma'am, your husband is a very important in the days all, all the mill owners were men. We have left room in this beautiful prayer book. And by the way, this prayer book is dated right here. 1886. This book is woven in silk in 1886. He then says to the wives, just have your husband weave in your family crest right here in the front of this beautiful prayer book I'm giving you. And so what do you think happens? The wives take this book, and they're so thrilled to receive a book woven in silk, a prayer book, and they go to their husband and goes, sweetheart, could we just weave our family crest in? And of course, no weaving machine can weave the family crest in. <laughs> and so they have to buy a Jacquard loom just to finish the book. <laughs>
How many did they sell? Do we know? They sold about 100 looms, and that was the origin of the Jacquard loom success. Uh -huh. The breakthrough in marketing imagination drove it literally to success. Now it gets more interesting because this idea of putting holes, or you know, in, in, in this case clay, versus putting holes in paper, looks really familiar here. This is an eight, IBM 80 column punch card. What is it? It's simply a Jacquard loom card. Okay. <laughs> It's a, you know, literally the computer revolution of data and software is embedded in paper cards. IBM used to make literally tens of millions of these cards every month in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And if you, by the way, if you've ever wondered why this 80 column punch card is this size, because the only equipment to sort punch cards was the same equipment to sort US currency. So they borrowed the US currency sorting equipment and they made the 80 column punch card exactly huh. that size. That's why it's that way. And by the way, data became money in the 1960s when we started printing savings bonds on IBM punch cards. Now at the same time this is all happening, John, another guy says, you know this idea of holes in things? I can do other things with holes in things. And this man, in literally 1851, comes up with the idea of creating a calculating machine Whereas Jacquard created holes in a card to literally drive a loom, all right? When we have de Calmar here, what de Calmar does is he creates gears right here. And he says, guess what? Instead of creating holes, I'll use gears. And these gears become the first arithmetic calculating machine. He invents the idea of using gears. Instead of to punch to drive holes, he uses gears to do the math. Driven by what? What was the? Driven by a hand crank. He just cranks the gears no, but like what a was, spring. What was, what was his inspiration? What so was his problem to solve? Everybody was trying to figure out, could machines, this is now the 1850s, it's the beginning of the machine age, could machines be used to actually calculate answers to problems? So this is before, you know, and this is the, could we create a machine? Because why? We're living at the beginning of the idea. Yeah. The idea is machines can do everything. We're at the beginning of the machine age. Right. How do we create machines to do math? Well, we created machines that can weave with amazing complexity. Can we create a machine? An abacus needs a human. Every other calculator is a human. And so there is a race on, literally, to say, hey, we can use machines to somehow do math. And de Comar patents in eight, this is one of the very first patents in the modern world. So this is 1857. The English only start patenting in around 1845. So in 1857, de Comar patents the first calculating machine. Hmm. Here too, we don't leave it as gears. Ultimately, people say, hey, these gears can be abstracted. We can create general purpose machines. We can create electronic calculators, et cetera. But the point I'm making here is we're not far from there to here. So this is a piece of core memory for a computer. This is actually. Uh, uh, how, how big was this? Once it this was, was the size of a tape. Okay, not this a, was the not, size not of your average Here's your first calculator. piece of core memory here. This is literally a Univac core memory. The intersection of two lines uh, of a screen door. If you think about your screen door, suspending a simple little metal thing allowed you to have a piece of one bit of memory. And this piece of core memory in its day, in 1962, and you'll see more of them outside in the exhibition, is the origin of the first time the data of COGS gets put into an electronic form. We capture it as a simple one and zero, charge, no charge, and a cell. So what's going on here is all of these people, they're not calling the experts from their field. Yeah, they have experts in their field. You'll need experts to design this. You'll need experts to make all this work. You'll need engineers. Don't get me wrong. But somebody's got to imagine how we're going to borrow from other fields and how we're going to cross-pollinate it in ways that, don't, that we don't expect. Hmm. That's the great challenge. We live in a world with 50 million technical experts. Somebody in the Netherlands and somebody else in Singapore is running around with thoughts in their head that can solve your business's problem, that can come up with ways where your technical challenge can be thought of in a very different way, using a very different technology. And we're all learning this as we externally innovate. We're going through a new level in our world today of innovation where we realize we can't do it ourselves. Mm. It's not our R&D departments anymore. Right? All the smartest people generally, as a rule, work for somebody else. Mm. It's a big world. We now are starting to figure out for the first time, how do we use big data to find the kinds of people 
who can help us solve these problems that in, for hundreds of years we had to do by chance. Yeah, and those large data sets are letting, letting, they're, us, they're letting us do it. But what, what does it say about the human imagination that two of your examples, that of the printing press and that of the loom, uh, were imagined and innovated by people who then failed to find a purpose for them. What or it says is that profitable we as business people often think if we have a new technology, the world's going to beat a path to our door. Bam, we got a better technology. It's just not true. Okay. What we've learned is you have to innovate in your marketing. You have to innovate in how you, in how you bring customers into the process. You know, there's an old story. If you ask customers what they want, it's a faster horse in 1852. They don't want a car. When you read Clayton Christensen Disruption Theory, your current customers just want what you're selling them today a little cheaper, a little faster, a little better. We look, they don't want disruption. We look back instead right. of forward. We're used to doing it this way, but the businesses that are going to outcompete, that are going to that are going to win the game, are not marginally improving. Yeah, they're doing that, yeah. but they're looking ahead to say, how do I create new customer bases? It's why so many of these internet businesses make no sense to many of us in this room. They're innovating against the customer base we barely understand. How can Instagram or Facebook be worth that kind of money? Right. How can you grow a business from zero to a billion customers in just a few years? How is that possible? But it is. We live in a world where imagination not only has to be for what technologies we create, but how we market them, how we attune them to our customers, and how we evolve them quickly so that as our customers tell us, hey, I could use that in this field, we're ready to go there.